The protests on Sunday in St. John's have continued to dominate headlines. The police have made it clear there was no permission for either a march or picket, picket sorry, and the group was dispersed with tear gas when they refused instructions to leave the streets. So this evening, we hear the views of a senior attorney, Dr. David Dorsett, on the legal arrangements governing marches, pickets, and other street protests, especially during the ongoing state of public emergency. Dr. Dorset joins us via Zoom. Very good evening, Dr. Dorset. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's start off here. What is your take on what transpired on Sunday in St. John's? Well, I have to confess, um, I don't, I'm not clued in with all of the facts of the situation, but what I can say, generally speaking, is that as of now, we are in a state of emergency that has been declared by parliament, the governor general for us uh, making the declaration, which declaration has been confirmed and continued by parliament. And in a state of emergency, um, they can be by the governmental authorities with the sanction of the law, a curtailment of what ordinary would be the rights of individuals as far as the constitutional rights for certain fundamental rights and freedoms. One of those rights has to do with the right of association, the right to meet. Um, and uh, during uh, regular times, the uh, right for peaceable assembly um, is guaranteed. However, uh, the, the authorities at all times have the power to curtail or to restrict those rights for reasons of public order and public health. Again, I, I have to say, I don't know the details of all that happened on Sunday, although I know generally what happened. What I can say is that at present, we are under a state of emergency. We have a situation where for several weeks, we had zero active cases of COVID. The latest information that I have is that we are now up to 59. That should be a cause of concern. COVID or no COVID, the law is very clear that for the purposes of having marches, etc., under the Public Order Act, the permission of the police is required. My reading of the act also says that if there is denial by the commission by the commission of the police, an appeal can be made by way to the minister. At this time and at all times, it is very important that notwithstanding the frustration that we may have with respect to the ongoing situation, notwithstanding what persons are calling COVID fatigue, the rule of law must be maintained at all times. And so generally speaking, if the police for the purposes of assessing a situation, including the situation where they have determined that for reasons of public order or public health, that a march should not be held, that decision I think has to be respected unless it is seen as being totally outrageous. All right, just to be, just to be clear, Dr. Dorset, this relates to marches, pickets and anything else on the streets? Is that what you're saying? Yes, that is correct, yes. And Dr. Dorset, what should individuals... The public act, Sorry, go ahead. There is need to obtain permission from the Commissioner of Police. Okay. okay. And what should individuals planning future protest action bear in mind? Well, um, one, they should one, apply early. Um, my understanding is that the decision of the Commissioner of Police came maybe two days before the intended march. So one, apply early so that you can get an early decision. If the decision is, is negative, you need to have sufficient time to appeal. So um, you need to give yourself a sufficient window. Also, please bear in mind that we are in a situation where um, we, are, we are in a state of emergency, and moreover, we have COVID cases that appear to be on the rise. I think all persons need to have regard for that and not, 
do anything that would accelerate the spread of COVID. Mm. Uh, and so, Dr. Dorsett, just very, very quickly, in relation to uh, how, just for a quick recap, in relation to how the state of emergency impacts on the present legal framework, that, that answer is, just remind us. The answer is that the, well, is the, 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 the restriction of a march in this case, I don't think this has to do so much with the state of emergency. What the Constitution provides generally that anything done under the authority of law that can be said to abridge the right to peaceful assembly will stand constitutional muster if it is reasonably required for the purposes of public order and public health. So the, the decision to not permit a march during this time can be justified, not because there's a state of emergency, but can be justified because there might be concerns, and I think legitimate concerns, about public health. COVID cases are on the rise. We had zero. We do not have zero at this time. 60 cases or 59 cases is 59 cases too many. All right, Dr. Dorset, thank you so much. Really appreciate you giving your expert legal opinion on this issue. And uh, certainly, uh, we'll get back to you at another point uh, to get more details on the situation. Thanks very much. Really appreciate it. Dr. David Dorset is, of course, a senior attorney. You know, the top brass of the police force says more arrests are to come following Sunday's protest action in St. John City. There are investigations going on right now, and there are more persons that are likely to be arrested and charged. Well, Commissioner Rodney advises 10 people have so far been taken into custody. The commissioner was asked how many more are likely to be arrested. Quite a few. We are reanalyzing some of the videos. Some of the officers are providing their information and an investigative team has been put into place and more actions will be taken against some persons. We know several countries around the region continue to maintain states of emergency and curfews in an effort to curtail COVID-19 transmission. Apart from Antigua and Barbuda in the OECS sub-region, St. Lucia, Grenada and St. Kitts and Nevis all have states of emergency in place along with curfews. St. Lucia and St. Kitts and Nevis have 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. curfews like here in Antigua and Barbuda while Grenada's curfew begins at midnight, lasts until 5 a.m. In the case of St. Kitts and Nevis, the state of emergency emergency lasts until the 31st of December this year. Barbados, meanwhile, has a state of emergency in place until the 22nd of August with an 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. curfew. Trinidad and Tobago has a state of emergency and a curfew in place with the curfew in effect from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. daily. Now, despite sporadic pushback to these measures in several countries, the governments have continued to maintain them, especially as the Delta variant of the coronavirus continues to pose a clear and present danger. Renowned medical journal, The Lancet, supports the vaccination of minors against COVID-19 to reduce the likelihood of class closures and protect their mental health. The peer-reviewed journal says early data from clinical trials show Pfizer-BioNTech's COVID-19 vaccine is safe for those 12 to 15. The publication says in the event of a COVID-19 epidemic rebound later this year, it anticipates vaccinated people will pose a reduced risk to the disease spread. The Lancet says if, chil if children are the only unvaccinated group, this could result in more infections occurring in schools, which would cause school closures. This, The Lancet says, would be highly detrimental to the education and well-being of children. It also says school closure can cause anxiety and depressive symptoms. Antigua and Barbuda hopes to begin vaccinating minors 12 to 17 with Pfizer's vaccine within weeks. The government has made it clear this will be optional and will follow consultations with key stakeholders. Well, all flags and public buildings are being flown at half-mast from now until the day of the state funeral for national hero and former Prime Minister Celeste Bryant Bird. The announcement came from the cabinet, which says it has been a mark of respect since yesterday when Sir Lester died. Meanwhile, a special cabinet committee has been announced to determine the final arrangements to honour the national hero, hero and former Prime Minister. Now, the committee is made up of Honourable Sir Malvin Joseph, Honourable Dean Jonas, 
and Honorable E.P. Chen Green. Meanwhile, Cabinet has expressed deepest condolences to, uh, to Lady Marie Patricia Byrd, the children of Celeste and the extended family of the late former Prime Minister. Members have spoken glowingly of Celeste's contributions. Here's a quote from that Cabinet press release. He has served the people of Antigua and Barbuda for over 45 years, making him the founding father of modern-day Antigua and Barbuda. We have lost one of our most precious, precious sons. It's a quote there from the cabinet release that was issued by a secretary of the cabinet, Konato Lee. Condolences have continued to pour in from regional and international bodies as well. As a nation reflects on Sir Lester's life and legacy, his pioneering role in engineering the country's modern tourism, tourism industry is often regarded as his single most seminal achievement. This evening, ABS revisits some of Sir Lester's own words regarding this country's most important revenue earning sector. Jessica Russell has been combing through the archives. In 1998, according to the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, Antigua and Barbuda tourism sector was the largest of all sectors in the OECS. So that's the speaking in 2018 at the budget debate as senior minister and advisor to the prime minister on ministerial matters. He spoke confidently on the resilience of tourism, stating the industry recovered and boomed after the September 11th terrorist attacks in 2001. Not only is it among the largest in industry worldwide, it has demonstrated a greater stability than world trade. It is, Mr. Speaker, an industry in which we can place confidence if properly managed. Solesto said he supported tourism as a force in helping Antigua and Barbuda become an economic powerhouse. However, he cautioned against the negative social and environmental impact that mass tourism could bring. We are better off with 450,000 tourists that generate expenditure of $3 billion than 500,000 tourists that generates the same amount of foreign exchange. He recommended that the industry be dominated by four- and five-star resorts. Celeste also said the country's tourism product at the time needed to be revamped. Our product has stagnated and suffers from inertia. He praised Prime Minister Gaston Brown for recognizing the need to reimagine the industry. In 2019, he approved of the government's decision to sign a deal with Global Post Holding to revamp Heritage Key. The key was Celeste's brainchild. I must uh, again congratulate the Labour Party and the Prime Minister for advancing and further developing Heritage Key. The beneficiaries of that are going to be the people of Antigua and Barbuda. He said maintaining Heritage Key would be a part of preserving his legacy. We can't allow it down because all that I did would be lost and I want to see it proceed. So I, I think it is excellent. Celeste died on Monday at 83. He was a national hero, former prime minister, and a tourism minister. Jessica Russell, ABS News. Thanks, Jessica. Meanwhile, the eldest of Celeste's children has told ABS News about what will most stand out for her from what the national hero said in the final weeks of his life. And he reminded me to remind my siblings and our children that we have an obligation and we must never forget even though we travel or we may work abroad, we must never forget that we have an obligation to this country and we have an obligation to make a contribution in some substantive um, manner. Meanwhile, Daniel Bird explains what he, what he considered, that's her father, considered his seminal achievements. Always spoke about the Heritage Key Project and the hospital. I think um, those two um, projects in particular were his seminal um, projects. He put a lot of heart and soul and passion and dedication. He fought for both of those. Yeah, he went through a lot um, to see those projects actually come to fruition. She wants people to remember him as a regionalist, a mover and a shaker, and the father of modern-day Antigua and Barbuda.
The Minister for Tourism and Investment, the Honorable Charles Fernandez, has paid tribute on the passing of national hero, former Prime Minister and Tourism Minister, Celeste Bryant Bird. Celeste served as Minister for Economic Development, Trade, Energy and Tourism from 1976 to 1989. Minister Fernandez says it was Sir Lester's vision and leadership that laid the foundation for the development of the tourism industry as the sugar trade waned. He says Sir Lester will be remembered for the role he played in the construction of the Royal Antiguan Hotel, Heritage Quay and its shopping center, and the Nevis Street Cruise Pier. The minister says Sir Lester's work created an economic boom and making Antigua and Barbuda the mecca of prosperity. This attracted thousands of Caribbean nationals to the country to share in its growth. Minister Fernandez says Sir Lester will long be revered as an architect of the post-colonial development of Antigua and Barbuda. Let's stay with the tributes because the country's oldest labor union, the Antigua Trades and Labor Union, is also adding its voice to the tributes to Celeste. The union expressed condolences to his family and credits the national hero with dedicating his life to improving the lives of the working class, not only in Antigua and Barbuda, but across the region. The union also acknowledges his keen intellect in managing the economic and fiscal affairs in the nation, as well as delineating critical issues on the world stage. Meanwhile, the University of the West Indies Five Island Campus praises Sir Lester as an ardent regionalist. The institution says he worked to advance the integration of the region through the organization of Eastern Caribbean states and the Caribbean community. It also credits him as the influence behind the decision to turn the Eastern Caribbean Currency Authority into a modern and vibrant Eastern Caribbean Central Bank fit for purpose to serve its member states. The university says Sir Lester aided in the establishment of the regional trade negotiating machinery for collective bargaining with the European Union in its post cotton New world. Principal of the campus, Professor Denzel A. Williams, says, and I quote, Sir Lester distinguished himself as a quintessential Caribbean man while not losing his Antiguaness. His vision paid dividend as Antigua saw a significant fall in unemployment rise in income and robust economic growth. Well, across the region, our tributes have continued to pour in for, uh, for, for Celeste. Here's taking a quick look at some of them. Grenada's Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Mitchell, says he'll forever be grateful for the many conversations he had with Celeste and the advice he selflessly imparted. He says the Caribbean has lost one of its most renowned leaders. Barbados' acting Prime Minister, uh, Sanchez Bradshaw, says, quote, Antiguan Barbuda has lost a political stalwart and we in Barbados grieve with you as a family should, end quote. St. Kitts and Nevis Prime Minister Dr. Timothy Harris says Celeste's sterling contribution to Antigua and Barbuda and the Caribbean community is etched in the annals of history and his presence and voice will be sorely missed. Jamaica's Prime Minister Andrew Holness says Celeste was a resonating voice on regional matters as he advocated for the recognition of small island states. Meanwhile, leader of Jamaica's main opposition party, the People's National Party, Mark Golding, says Celeste was a towering statesman and an iconic regional figure. Meanwhile, Organization of Eastern Caribbean States Director General Dr. Didicus Jules says the OECS Commission extends its condolences to the family of Celeste and Antiguans and Barbudans. And Celeste was the OECS's first chairman in 1982 and served again in 1989. In recognition of Celeste's passing, the OECS Commission's flag was flown at half mast, as have flags attached to all government buildings in Antigua and Barbuda. And United States uh, Ambassador to the Eastern Caribbean, Linda Tagliela says, as the first OECS chairman, Celeste understood the importance of regional integration. You know, our president of the, Bolivian, of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, speaks highly of Celeste's role in regional integration and cooperation. Celeste Bird was a determined leader who marked a historic change for the region, and especially for Antigua and Barbuda, according to Nicolas Maduro. He demonstrated an advanced political conscience and understood the importance that unity represents as a preponderant factor for the peoples. The two countries have enjoyed strong diplomatic relations. Antigua and Barbuda is one of 11 member states signed on to the Bolivarian Alternative for the Peoples of Our Americas. That's ALBA.
Still to come, more of the stories that we're following closely for you here, as only ABS News can, including this one. A Potter's teenager is reported missing. We will tell you about the report made to the police. Plus later, we'll tell you that ABS television, well, it has gone global yet again because ABS television radio has partnered with the Commonwealth Secretariat to launch the Youth Development Index. We'll tell you about all that upcoming on the ABS Evening News on air and online. Please tell us this. At Magic, the things that matter to you matter to us. At your boat when you exceed and get away from it. Your home and the security of your daughter's things. And the car that you've had for too long. But after all these years, you just can't let go. At Magico, we're about much more than just insurance. We're about the big things and the small things that mean everything. It's not easy getting rid of these types of greases every day. It's hard work. But if you really think about it, it's not really us doing the cleaning. At Total Import Supplies, we believe it's all about the product. Our extensive new line of ChemClean products are extremely concentrated, eco-friendly, effective, and guaranteed to make your life a whole lot easier. Whether you're cleaning at home, the office, or at industrial-type spaces, when it comes to food-based solvents, sanitizers, cleaners, floor care, commercial machines, and dispensers for laundry care, let the product do most of the work for you. Introducing the best brands in the cleaning business from ChemClean Limited. Available only from Total Import Supplies. We're outside with Automotive Art. Automotive Art is giving you the chance to stay at Buccaneer Beach Club or win a car spa package from Island View Car Wash with exclusive discounts from 15 to 50% off to special service packages including your tires, batteries, oils, and tools. It's so easy to enter our raffle when you spend $250 or more. Visit Automotive Art on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube and win big this summer with Automotive Art. This promotion ends September 4th. Top up on snacks, juices, and household supplies. When you shop at KL Distributors, we promise affordable prices and variety like you've never seen. Have fun with our three for five snack pack. You mix and match popcorn, Cheetos, Doritos, enough for the kids during these long summer days. We also carry a variety of cereals, granola bars, and healthy snacks. Juices and sodas, we've got it all. Sunny D and Capri Sun for the kids. Ocean Spray, Tropicana, Canada Dry, and Ice Tea. Pick up your favorite house items, supplies such as laundry detergent and fragrance boosters and other cleaning agents. Free island-wide delivery on orders over $60. We're k &L Distributors and Supplies to George Walter Highway, Utopia Park Complex, adjacent Mr. Terminator Car Wash. We flow, win a bag of money, cash out, get a bag of money, we the do with a bag of money, yeah, from flow. Okay, so check it. Flo was giving away $30,000 in cash. Each Friday, two people would win $1,000 each. Now hear this, two lucky grand prize winners will also each get $10,000. Okay, so how do you get to win these prizes? It's simple, sign up for a new Flex Postpaid plan, activate an always on prepaid plan, pay your bill in full and on time and win. Get a new flex postpaid plan, activate an always-on prepaid plan, pay your bill in full and on time, and win. Flow terms and conditions apply. Welcome back. Alfred Dallas, a St. Johnston Village man previously on remand for attempted murder, is now facing the more serious charge of murder. It comes after Steve Francis succumbed to injuries allegedly inflicted on him by Dallas. Police say Dallas stabbed Francis during an altercation at a playing field in the St. Johnston Village area on the 14th of July, and Francis died a week later on July 21. Law enforcers say investigations suggest the cause of death is in keeping with the injuries sustained during the altercation. The defendant will return to court for committal proceedings on the 21st of September. Potter's teenager Raheem Thomas is missing. A police bulletin says he was last seen at home between 8 and 8.30 on Monday morning. Police are seeking the public's help in locating the boy. He's 5 feet 8 inches tall and slimly built. Anyone with information is asked to contact the nearest police station or the youth intervention unit at 562 8417 immediately. 
Well, uh, Another act of kindness from the Calvin Air Foundation has saved the life of a woman who fell from the old Miami building late last month. Kathy Appel and her family are counting their blessings for life-saving surgery after a fall that left her paralyzed. Sherilyn Beezer has the heartwarming details. Over the weekend, an emotional Lori Pell accepted a donation check of $88,450 from the Calvin Air Foundation on behalf of his sister, Kathy Appel's surgery. I need to thank Mr. Calvin Air for such a big donation towards my sister's surgery. Much appreciated, sir. He had high praise and appreciation for social activist Mary John, who had contacted the foundation on Kathia's behalf. I sent the rationale off to Ambassador Air, and the response came back in maybe two and a half hours. And his exact words were, yes, we're going to help this person. Nobody is beneath some form of dignity in their life when things like this happen. Cohen says, in addition to funding the surgery and hospitalization fees, Ambassador Ayer also flew in consulting orthopedic surgeon Dr. Mark Prempe from the United Kingdom. Dr. Prempe arrived on Saturday afternoon, and the seven-hour surgery, which began Saturday night into Sunday morning, was performed at Medical Surgical Associates. The difficult operation, a posterior cervical reduction and fixation, provides realignment and stabilization of spinal segments and involves removing the damaged disc and inserting a cage. Dr. Prempe says Pell wouldn't have lived had she not had this surgery to her neck to be able to breathe independently. Dr. Prempe says she's essentially quadriplegic. She does have some function in her left arm and if with the surgery and with proper rehab and so on, um, the, the best case scenario is that she might be able to use a, an electric wheelchair. He says the surgery is just the beginning of a long journey, noting she has a lot to confront both psychologically and physically. Sherilyn Beza reporting for ABS News. Thanks, Sherilyn. A really heartwarming story there. Now, ABS Television Radio has been chosen as the broadcast partner for the global launch of the 2020 Commonwealth Youth Development Index. ABS's studio in St. John's is the hub for the special program, which is being beamed across all 54 member countries in the Commonwealth and beyond. This is one of the most anticipated reports and is being launched by Secretary General Patricia Scotland, Queen's Council. There have been reactions from Honorable Gaston Brown, Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda and Chairman of CARICOM, as well as as a panel of youth leaders from across the world. Antiguan Barbuda and is among six Commonwealth states not included in the index because of insufficient data. The other countries not included are Dominica, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Nauru and Tuvalu. Now here's a snippet of the findings. Although progress has been slow, youth development continues to improve throughout the world. With the average global youth development score between 2010 and 2018 improving, by 3.1 percent. And this what your appetite right for right now. The program will reach the two and a half billion people across the Commonwealth and is another manifestation of the increasingly global reach of ABS television radio. Broadcasting Minister and the Minister with Portfolio Responsibility for the National Broadcaster, Honorable Melford Nicholas, and ABS General Manager Erna Mae Brathwaite have welcomed the development. Mrs. Brathwaite says that she's pleased ABS television radio has been selected as the broadcast partner for the launch of this Youth Development Index. She's also quoted as saying, it is tremendously gratifying that the the station's strides in pushing the frontiers of excellence have drawn the attention of the Commonwealth Secretariat. All right, so you, of course, will be telling you that coming up at 8.15, you'll be able to see uh, that Youth Development Index, the launch of it. And in fact, before that, at 8 o'clock, you can't afford to miss another powerful interview as we continue to reflect on the life and legacy of national hero and former Prime Minister Celeste Brown Bird. We'll be hearing from Hugh Marshall Sr. Uh, he'll be talking with us at 8 o'clock this evening to be followed right after by the Commonwealth Youth Development Index. When we come back from this break, we'll turn our attention to news overseas. One of the stories that we're tracking closely for you is this one. We'll tell you about the harrowing story of a woman who has died in Trinidad and Tobago from COVID-19 complications after recently delivering her baby. And in international news, embattled New York Governor Andrew Cuomo resigns following sexual harassment allegations. Those stories all ahead. Do stay with us. <laughs> 